everyone. Welcome to the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. I am Bill Mallory, branch manager of the La Jolla Library, and we are doing our live reading of Captain Blood by Raphael Sabatini, a uh, jolly good pirate story. And uh, we'll be reading chapter 18 today, uh, just to kind of go over the stuff that has happened up to this point. So, in our last chapter, we have just finished off the uh, Maracaibo uh, section of the story, where our our pirate heroes have taken uh, two ships and a third ship by a, a second uh, by another person into the Lake of Maracaibo, thereby to raid and plunder the town of Maracaibo, and um, one of the ships. It gets stuck on a sandbar in the middle of the lake and is basically lost. Uh, but that's not Peter Blood's ship. That's the ship of one of his compatriots, uh, a gentleman named Cahusac, a French uh, pirate that he has entered into an agreement with. He rescues all the sailors that are aboard that ship and puts them on his two ships. But then during all this time, the uh, several uh, ships from the Spanish fleet have gotten word and they have reached the opening of uh, into the lake and have blocked it so that way uh, Captain Blood and his ships cannot escape. So through subterfuge and chicanery and um, a lot of sneakiness, the... Um, Captain Blood has not only escaped, he's set fire to the Encarnacion, which is the Admiral's own ship. He has uh, taken uh, two ships and uh, used them as, as plunder as part of the, uh, the raid. So even though they didn't get a whole lot in the town of Maracaibo, they did get uh, several ships. And uh, meanwhile, Cahusac... Uh, at Peter Blood's urging, basically says, hey, if you just go and surrender now to the Admiral, he'll probably just let you go. He doesn't want you anyway. He wants me, uh, because, of course, the Admiral holds Peter Blood responsible for the death of his brother. And um, and so they take them up. All the French pirates take them up on that offer, and they escape. However, they're what they find out as... Peter Blood's ships, again, uh, attack and and sneakily escape from uh, the, the Spanish uh, Navy ships. They run into another Spanish Navy ship some miles away, only to find out that it was a reinforcement ship that they've kept talking about during this whole thing. They kept saying, well, reinforcements are coming, reinforcements are coming. Well, this was the reinforcement ship, and they capture it, and uh, once they get in there, uh, start opening hatches, they realize that the cargo hold is full of people. So they think, oh my gosh, it's a slave ship. Well, it's not a slave ship. As it turns out, Cahusac and all the French sailors, the ones who survived anyway, uh, ran afoul of this single Spanish vessel that uh, that came in and uh, and captured them all. So once again, Peter Blood has captured yet another ship, and he has rescued all the French pirates, although he doesn't think much of them, so uh, so that's kind of the end of their association with the French pirates. Um, and so, and that's kind of where this, the story ended. It was actually really, I mean, clever. I mean, it's, I, it's just, I just, I, I love these stories because it's, um, I think there's, there's some really good, clever plot twists in here, and a lot of, you know, cannon fire and and pirates being sneaky, and it's all good stuff. So, we are now on chapter 18 today, which is entitled The Milagrosa. The affair at Maracaibo is to be considered as Captain Blood's buccaneering masterpiece. Although there is scarcely one of the many actions that he fought, recorded in such particular detail by Jeremy Pitt, which does not afford some instance of his genius for naval tactics. 
Yet in none is more shiningly displayed than in those two engagements by which he won out of the trap which Don Miguel de Espinosa had sprung upon him. The fame which he had enjoyed before this, great as it already was, is dwarfed into insignificance by the fame that followed. It was a fame such as no buccaneer, not even Morgan, has uh, ever boasted before or since. In Tortuga, during the months he spent there refitting the three ships he had captured from the fleet that had gone out to destroy him, he found himself uh, almost an object of worship in the eyes of the wild brethren of the coast, all of whom now clamored for the honor of serving under him. It placed him in a rare position of being able to pick and choose the crews for his augmented fleet, and he chose fastidiously. When next he sailed away, it was with a fleet of five fine ships, in which went something over a thousand men. Thus you behold him not merely famous, but really formidable. The three captured Spanish vessels he had renamed with a certain scholarly humor, the Clotho, the Lachesis, and Atropos, a grimly jocular manner of conveying to the world that he had made them the arbiters of the fate of any Spaniards he should henceforth encounter upon the seas. I'm going to stop right here and let you know what the significance of this is. I look it up so you don't have to. Uh, in Greek mythology, the, the fate of human beings is woven by three women. And the, those fate weavers are named Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. And so what he is, he's basically named each of these three new captured vessels after one of the, the weavers of the fate of humanity. So there we go. I'll probably do a Facebook post to kind of explain some more details on that. But, uh, but that's, that's where we're going with this. That's the scholarly humor here, his little inside joke. To continue. In Europe, the news of this fleet following upon the news of the Spanish admiral's defeat at Maracaibo produced something of a sensation. Spain and England were variously and unpleasantly exercised. And if you care to turn up the diplomatic correspondence exchanged on the subject, you will find that it is considerable and not always amiable. And meanwhile, in the Caribbean, the Spanish admiral Don Miguel de Espinosa might be said, to use a term not yet invented in his day, to have run amuck. The disgrace into which he had fallen as a result of the disasters suffered at the hands of Captain Blood had driven the Admiral all but mad. It is impossible, if we dispose our minds impartially, to withhold a certain sympathy from Don Miguel. Hate was now this unfortunate man's daily bread, and the hope of vengeance, an obsession to his mind. As a madman, he went raging up and down the Caribbean, seeking his enemy, and in the meantime, as an hors d'oeuvre to his vindictive appetite, he fell upon any ship of England or of France that loomed above his horizon. I need say no more to convey the fact that this illustrious sea captain and great gentleman of Castile had lost his head and was become a pirate in his turn. The Supreme Council of Castile might anon condemn him for his practices. But how should the matter to one who already was condemned beyond rede redemption? On the contrary, if he should live to lay the audacious and ineffable blood by the heels, it was possible that Spain might view his present irregularities and earlier losses with a more lenient eye. And so, reckless of the fact that Captain Blood was now in vastly superior strength, the Spaniard brought him up and uh, sought him up and down the trackless seas. But for a whole year he sought him vainly. The circumstances in which uh, eventually they met are very curious. An intelligent observation of the facts of human existence will re reveal to shallow-minded folk who sneer 
at the use of coincidence in the arts of fiction and drama that life itself is little more than a series of coincidences. Open the history of the past at whatsoever page you will, and th there you shall find chance, uh, you shall find coincidence at work bringing about events that the merest chance might have averted. Indeed, coincidence may be defined as the very tool used by fate to shape the destinies of men and nations. Observe it now at work in the affairs of Captain Blood and of some others. On the 15th of September of this of the year 1688, a memorable year in the annals of England, three ships were afloat upon the Caribbean, which in their coming conjunctions were to work out the fortunes of several persons. The first of these was Captain Blood's flagship, the Arabella, which uh, had been separated from the buccaneer fleet in a hurricane off the Lesser Antilles. In somewhere about 17 degrees north latitude and 74 degrees longitude, she was beating up for the windward passage before the intermittent southeasterly breezes of that stifling season homing for Tortuga, the natural rendezvous of dispersed vessels. The second ship was the great Spanish galleon, the Milagrosa, which, accompanied by the smaller frigate Hild Hidalga, lurked off the coast of uh, Kemites uh, to, to the north of the long peninsula that thrusts out from the southwest corner of Hispaniola. Aboard the Milagrosa sailed the vindictive Don Miguel. The third and last of these ships which, with which we are at present concerned, was an English man of war, which, on the date I have given, was at anchor in the French port of St. Nicholas, on the northwest coast of Hispaniola. She was on her way from Plymouth to Jamaica, and carried on board a very distinguished passenger in the person of Lord Julian Wade, who came charged by his kinsman, uh, my Lord Sunderland, with a mission of some consequence and delicacy, directly arising out of that vexatious correspondence between England and Spain. The French government, like the English, excessively annoyed by the depredations of the buccaneers and the constant straining of relations with Spain that ensued, had sought in vain to put them down by enjoining the utmost severity against them upon her various overseas governors. But, but these either like the governor of Tortuga, throve out of a scarcely tacit partnership with the filibusters, or, like the governor of French Hispaniola, felt that they were to be encouraged as a check upon the power and greed of Spain, which might otherwise be exerted to the disadvantage of the colonies of other nations. They looked, indeed, with apprehension upon recourse to any vigorous measure, measures which must result in driving many of the buccaneers to seek new hunting grounds to the South Sea. To satisfy King James' anxiety to conciliate Spain, and uh, in response to the Spanish ambassador's constant and grievous expostulations, my Lord Sunderland, the Secretary of State, had appointed a strong man to the deputy governorship of Jamaica, this strong man was that Colonel Bishop, who for years now, for some years now, had been the most influential planter in Barbados. Colonel Bishop had accepted the post and departed from the plantations in which his great wealth had, uh, was being amassed with the eagerness that uh, had its roots in a desire to pay off a score of his own with Peter Blood. From his first coming to Jamaica, Colonel Bishop had made himself felt by the buccaneers. But do what he might, the one buccaneer whom he made particular his particular quarry, that Peter Blood, who had once had been his slave, eluded him ever, and continued undeterred and in great force to harass the Spaniards upon the sea and land, and to keep the relations 
between England and Spain in a state of perpetual ferment, particularly dangerous in those days when the peace uh, of Europe was precariously maintained. Exasperated not only by his own accumulated chagrin, but also by the reproaches for his failure which reached him from London, Colonel Bishop actually went so far as to consider hunting his quarry in Tortuga itself and making an attempt to clear the island of the buccaneers it sheltered. Fortunately for himself, he abandoned the notion of so insane an enterprise, deterred not only by the enormous natural strength of the place, but also by the reflection that a raid upon, the, upon what was, nominally at least a French settlement, must be attended by grave offense to France. Yet, short of some measure, uh, sh short of some such measure, it appeared to Colonel Bishop that he was baffled. He confessed as much in a letter to the Secretary of State. This letter and the state of things which it disclosed made my Lord Sunderland despair of solving this vexatious problem by ordinary means. He turned to the consideration of extraordinary ones and bethought him of the plan adopted with Morgan, who had been enlisted into the king's service under Charles II. It occurred to him that a similar course might be similarly effective with Captain Blood. His lordship did not omit the consideration that Blood's present outlawry might well have been undertaken not from inclination but under stress of sheer necessity, that he had been forced into it by the circumstances of his transportation, and that he would welcome the opportunity of emerging from it. Acting upon this conclusion, Sunderland sent out his kinsman, Lord Julian Wade, with some commissions made out uh, in blank, and full directions as to the course which the secretary considered it desirable to pursue, and yet uh, full discretion in the matter per of pursuing them. The crafty Sunderland, master of all labyrinths of intrigue, advised his kinsman that in the event of finding blood intractable, or judging for other reasons that it was not desirable to enlist him in the king's service, he should turn his attention to the officers serving under him, and by seducing them away from him, leave him so weakened that they must fall an easy victim to Colonel Bishop's fleet. The Royal Mary, the vessel bearing that ingenious, tolerably accomplished, mildly dissolute, entirely elegant envoy of my Lord Sunderland's, made a good passage to St. Nicholas, her last port of call before Jamaica. It was understood that as a preliminary, Lord Julian should report himself to the Deputy Governor at Port, port Royal, whence it need he might have himself conveyed, conveyed to Tortuga. Now it happened that the deputy governor's niece had come to St. Nicholas some months earlier on a visit to some relatives, and so that she might escape the insufferable heat of Jamaica in that season. The time for her return being now at hand, a passage was sought for her aboard the Royal Mary, and in view of her uncle's rank and position promptly accorded. Lord Julian hailed her advent with satisfaction. It gave a voyage uh, that had been full of interest for him, just the spice that it required to achieve perfection as an experience. His lordship was one of your gallants, to whom existence that is not graced by a womankind is more or less of a stagnation. Miss Arabella Bishop, this straight up and down slip of a girl, with her rather boyish voice and her almost boyish ease of movement, was not perhaps a lady who in England would have commanded much notice in my lord's discerning eyes. His very sophisticated, carefully educated tastes in such matters inclined him toward the plump, the languishing, and the quite helplessly feminine. Miss Bishop's charms were undeniable, but they were such that it would take a delicate-minded man to appreciate them, 
and my lord Julian, whilst of a mind that was very far from gross, did not possess the necessary degree of delicacy. I must not by this be understood to imply anything against him. It remained, however, that Miss Bishop was a young woman and a lady, and in the latitude into which Lord Julian had strayed, this was a phenomenon sufficiently rare to command attention. On his side, with his title and position, his personal grace, and the charm of a practiced courtier, he bore all about he bore about him the atmosphere of the great world in which he normally ha he had uh, his being a world that was little more than a name to her, who had spent most of her life in the Antilles. It is not, therefore, wonderful that they should have been attracted to each other before the Royal Mary was warped out of St. Nicholas. Each could tell the other much upon which the other desired information. He would regale her imagination with stories of St. James's, in many of which he uh, assigned himself a heroic, or at least a distinguished part, and she could enrich his mind with the information with information concerning this new world to which he had come. Before they were out of sight of St. Nicholas, they were good friends, and his lordship was beginning to correct his first impressions of her and to discover the charm of that frank, straightforward attitude of comradeship which made her treat every man as a brother. Considering how his mind was obsessed with the business of her of his mission, it is not wonderful uh, it is not wonderful that he should have come to talk to her of Captain Blood. Indeed, there was a circumstance that directly led to it. I wonder now, he, he said, as they were sauntering on the poop. If you ever saw this fellow, Blood, who was at one time on your uncle's plantations as a slave. Miss Bishop halted. She leaned upon the taffrail, looking out towards the receding land, and it was a moment before she answered in a steady, level voice. I saw him often. I knew him very well. "'You don't say!' his lordship was slightly moved out of a, an imperturbability that he had studiously cultivated. He was a young man of perhaps eight and twenty, well above the middle height in stature and appearing taller by virtue of his exceeding leanness. He had a thin, pale, rather pleasing hatchet face, framed in the curls of a golden periwig, a sensitive mouth and pale blue eyes that lent his countenance a dreamy expression, a rather melancholy pensiveness. But they were alert, observant eyes, notwithstanding, although they failed on this occasion to observe the slight change of color which his question had brought to Miss Bishop's cheeks, or the suspiciously excessive composure of her manner, of her answer. "'You don't say,' he repeated, and came to lean beside her. "'And what and what manner of man did you find him?' "'In those days I esteemed him for an unfortunate gentleman. "'You were acquainted with his story? "'He told it me. "'That is why I esteemed him, "'for the calm fortitude with which he bore adversity. "'Since then,' Considering what he has done, I have almost come to doubt if what he told me of himself was true. If you mean of the wrongs he suffered at the hands of the Royal Commission that tried the Monmouth rebels, there is little doubt that it would be true enough. He was never out with Monmouth, that is certain. He was convicted on a point of law of which he may well have been ignorant when he committed what was construed into treason. But faith, he's had his revenge after a fashion. That, she said in a small voice, is the unforgivable thing. It has destroyed him deservedly. Destroyed him? His lordship laughed a little. 
be not so sure of that. He has grown rich, I hear. He has translated, uh, so it is said, his Spanish spoils into French gold, which is being treasured up for him in France. His future father-in-law, uh, Monsieur de Ogeron, has seen to that. His future father-in-law, said she, and stared at him, round-eyed with parted lips, then added, Monsieur de Ogeron, the governor of Tortuga? Well, the same. You see, the fellow's well protected. It's a piece of news I gathered in St. Nicholas. I'm not sure that I welcome it, for I am not sure that it makes any easier a task upon which my kinsman, Lord Sunderland, has sent me hither. But there it is. You didn't know? She shook her head without replying. She had averted her face, and her eyes were staring down at the gently heaving water. After a moment she spoke her voice steady and perfectly controlled. But surely, if this were true, there would have been an end to his piracy by now. If he, if he loved a woman and was betrothed, and was also rich, as you say, surely he would have abandoned the, this desperate life, and... Why, so I thought, his lordship interrupted, until I had the explanation... The Ogeron is avaricious for himself and for his child, and as for the girl, I'm told she's a wild piece, fit mate for such a man as blood. Almost, I marvel, that he doesn't marry her and take her a-roving with him. It would be no new experience for her, and I marvel, too, at blood's patience. He killed a man to win her. He killed a man for her, do you say? There was horror now in her voice. Yes, a French uh, buccaneer named Levasseur. He was the girl's lover and Blood's associate on a venture. Blood coveted the girl and killed Levasseur to win her. Ha! It's an unsavory tale, I own. But men live by different codes out in these parts. She had turned to face him. She was pale to the lips, and her hazel eyes were blazing as she cut into his apologies for blood. They must indeed, if his other associates allowed him to live after that. Oh, the thing was done in a fair fight, I'm told. Who told you? A man who sailed with them, a Frenchman named Cahusac whom I found in a waterside tavern in St. Nicholas. He was Lavasseur's lieutenant, and he was present on the island where the thing happened and when Lavasseur was killed. And the girl? Did he say the girl was present too? Yes, she was a witness to the, of the encounter. Blood carried her off when he had disposed of his brother Buccaneer. And the dead man's followers allowed it. He caught a note of incredulity in her voice, but missed the note of relief with which it was blent. Oh, I don't believe the tale. I won't believe it. I honor you for that, Miss Bishop. It strained my own belief that men should be so callous until this Cahusac afforded me an explanation. What? She checked her unbelief, an unbelief that had uplifted her from the inexplicable dismay. Clutching the rail, she swung round to face his lordship with that question. Later he was to remember and perceive in her present behavior a certain oddness which went disregarded now. Blood purchased their consent and his right to carry the girl off. He paid them in pearls that were worth more than twenty thousand pieces of eight. His lordship laughed again, with a touch of contempt. A handsome price. Faith, they're scoundrels all, just thieving venal curs. And faith, it's a pretty tale, this for a lady's ear. She looked away from him again and found that her sight was blurred. After a moment, in a voice less steady than before, she asked him, 
Why should this Frenchman have told you such a tale? Did he hate this Captain Blood? I did not gather that, said the Lordship slowly. He related it, oh, just as a commonplace, an instance of buccaneering ways. A commonplace, said she. My God, a commonplace. I dare say that we, all, we are all savages under the cloak that civilization fashions for us, said his lordship. But this blood now was a man of considerable parts from what else this Cahusac told me. He was a bachelor of medicine. That is true to my own knowledge. And he has seen much foreign service on sea and land. Cahusac said, or rather this I hardly credit, that he had fought under de Ruyter. That is, that also is true, said she. She sighed heavily. Your Cahusac seems to have been accurate enough, alas. You are sorry, then? She looked at him. She was very pale, he noticed. As we are sorry to hear of the death of one we have esteemed, once I held him in regard for an unfortunate but worthy gentleman. Now... She checked and smiled a little crooked smile. Such a man is best forgotten. And upon that she passed at once to speak of other things. The friendship, which it was her great gift to command in all she met, grew steadily between those two in the little time remaining until the event befell that marred what was uh, promising to be the pleasantest stage of his lordship's voyage. The Marplot was the mad dog Spanish admiral whom they encountered on the second day out when halfway across the Gulf of Ganaves. The captain of the Royal Mary was not disposed to be intimidated even when Don Miguel opened fire on him. Observing the Spani Spaniard's plentiful uh, seaboard towering high above the water and offering him so splendid a mark, the Englishman was moved to scorn. If this uh, Don who flew the banner of Castile wanted to fight, the Royal Mary was just the ship to oblige him. It may be that he was justified of his gallant confidence, and that he would that day have put an end to the wild career of Don Miguel de Espinosa. But that a lucky shot from the Milagrosa got among some powder stored in the forecastle, and blew up half his ship almost before the fight had started. How the powder came there will never now be known but the gallant captain himself did not survive to inquire into it. Before the men of the Royal Mary had recovered from their consternation, their captain killed and a third of their number destroyed with him, the ship yawing and rocking helplessly in a crippled state, the Spaniards boarded her. In the captain's cabin, under the poop to which Miss Bishop had been conducted for safety. Lord Julian was seeking to comfort and encourage her, with assurances that all would yet be well, at the very moment when Don Miguel was stepping aboard. Lord Julian himself was none so steady, and his face was undoubtedly pale. Not that he was uh, by any means a coward. But this cooped-up fighting on an unknown element in a thing of wood that might at any moment founder under the, his feet into the depths of the ocean was disturbing to one who could be brave enough ashore. Fortunately, Miss Bishop did not appear to be in desperate need of the poor comfort he was in case to offer. Certainly she, too, was pale, and her hazel eyes may have looked a little larger than usual. But she had herself well in hand. Half sitting, half leaning on the captain's table, she preserved her courage sufficiently to seek to calm the octoroon waiting, women, waiting woman who uh, 
was groveling at her feet in a state of terror. And then the captain, the cabin door flew open, and Don Miguel himself, tall, sunburned, and aquiline of face, strode in. Lord Julian span around to face him and clapped a hand to his sword. The Spaniard was brisk and to the point. Don't be a fool, he said in his own tongue, or you'll come by a fool's end. Your ship is sinking. There were three or four men in Morions behind Don Miguel, and Lord Julian realized the position. He realized, he released, I'm sorry, he released his hilt, and a couple of feet or so of steel slid softly back into the scabbard. But Don Miguel smiled with a flash of white teeth behind his grizzled beard and held out his hand. If you please, he said. Lord Julian hesitated. His eyes strayed to Miss Bishop's. I think you had better, said that composed young lady, whereupon, with a shrug, his lordship made the required surrender. Come you, all of you, aboard my ship, Don Miguel invited them, and strode out. They went, of course. For one thing, the Spaniard had force to compel them, for another, a ship which he announced to be sinking offered them little inducement to remain. They stayed no longer than was necessary to enable Miss Bishop to collect some spare articles of dress and my lord to snatch up uh, his valise. As for the survivors in that ghastly shambles that uh, had been the Royal Mary, they were abandoned by the Spaniards to their own resources. Let them take to their boats and if those did not suffice them, let them swim or drown. If Lord Julian and Miss Bishop were retained, it was because Don Miguel perceived their obvious value. He received them in his cabin with great urbanity. Urbanely, he desired to have the honor of being acquainted with their names. Lord Julian, sick with horror of the spectacle that he had just witnessed, commanded himself with difficulty to supply them. Then, haughtily, he demanded to know in his turn the name of their aggressor. He was in an exceedingly ill temper. He realized that if he had done nothing positively discreditable in the unusual and difficult position into which fate had thrust him, at least he could have uh, done nothing creditable. This might have mattered less but that the spectator of his indifferent performance was a lady. He was determined, if possible, to do better now. I am Don Miguel de Espinosa, he was answered, Admiral of the Navies of the Catholic King. Lord Julian gasped. If Spain made such a hubbub about the depredations of a runagate adventurer like Captain Blood, what could not England answer now? Will you tell me, then, why you behave like a filthy pirate? He asked, and added, I hope you realize what will be the consequences and the strict account to which you shall be brought for this day's work, for the blood you have murderously shed, and for your violence to this lady and to myself. I offer you no violence, said the admiral, smiling, as only the man who holds the trumps can smile. On the contrary, I have saved your lives. Saved our lives? Lord Julian was momentarily speechless before such callous impudence. And what of the lives you have destroyed in wanton butchery? By God, man, they shall cost you dear. Don Miguel's smile persisted. It is possible. All things are possible. Meantime, it is your own lives that will cost you dear. Colonel Bishop is a rich man, and you, my lord, are no doubt also rich. I will consider and fix your ransom. So that you're, so that you're just the damned murderous pirate I was supposing you stormed his lordship, 
and you shall have the impudence to call yourself the admiral of the navies of the Catholic king. We shall see what your Catholic king will have to say to it. The admiral ceased to smile. He revealed something of the rage that had eaten into his brain. You shall, you do not understand, he said. It is that I treat you English heretic dogs, just as you English heretic dogs have treated Spaniards upon the seas, you robbers and thieves out of hell. I have the honesty to do it in my own name, but you, you perfidious beasts, you send your Captain Bloods, your Hagthorps, and your Morgans against us, and disclaim responsibility for what they do. Like a pilot, you wash your hands. He laughed savagely. Let Spain play the part of pilot. Let her disclaim uh, responsibility for me when your ambassador at the Escurial shall go whining to the Supreme Council of this act of piracy by Don Miguel de Espinosa. Captain Blood and the rest are not admirals of England, cried Lord Julian. Are they not? How do I know? How does Spain know? Are you not all, not liars all, you English heretics? Sir, Lord Julian's voice was harsh as a rasp. His eyes flashed. Instinctively, he swung a hand to the place where his sword had habitually hung. Then he shrugged and sneered. Of course, said he, it sorts with all I have heard of Spanish honor and all that I have seen of yours, that you should insult a man who is unarmed and your prisoner. The admiral's face flamed scarlet. He half raised his hand to strike, and then, restrained, perhaps, by the very words that had cloaked the retorting insult, he turned on his heel abruptly and went out without answering. And that, my friends, is the conclusion of chapter 18. Woo! What's going on? Not, uh, not too much Peter Blood in this, really. It was really more uh, of all the uh, other characters. And uh, certainly the unexpected return of Arabella Bishop. And so, what will happen in our next chapter... The only way to find out is to join us again on Monday at 4 p.m. as we'll read chapter 19, and uh, we'll see where the story goes, what will happen, and will Peter Blood return to uh, to take the forefront of our, of our narrative here? Find out uh, on Monday. I hope you have a good weekend. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you again. Thanks, everyone. Take care.